I will give the floor to Emma, who I already mentioned is the fundraising and events manager for Derby County Community Trust. And she will take us through to uh, the work of the trust and the event that they have that's called the Turby, uh, Turby 10K. So Emma, the floor is yours now and you're, feel, feel free to share your screen. Thank you. I'll just share my screen with you all, one second. Bear with me, sorry. Can everybody see that screen? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay, from the beginning. Okay. Uh, so yeah, first off, just a massive thank you, really, for um, for inviting me to share the, uh, my experiences and our event with you. Um, and I'll share a little bit about the charity that I work for and the event that um, is our sort of flagship fundraising event, really. So um, I hope you find it useful. Um, the way that I've set it out is to sort of introduce the charity, introduce the events, and also give you some hints and tips on organising your own events. Um, but a little bit about me first. Um, as you know now, my name's Emma, um, and I'm the fundraising and events manager for Derby County Community Trust. And we're a charity here in the UK. Um, I've been working in the events industry for the past six years, um, but have been organising sports event, events as a volunteer for many years. I've been involved in um, sports clubs as an athlete myself and have moved on to coach and co-own sports clubs. So um, sport and sort of health and wellbeing is my passion and delivering and planning events to help others participate is sort of where my interests really lie. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about Derby County Community Trust and then we'll move on to the event in a bit more specifics. So a little bit about us. Um, we're the Community Trust, Derby County Community Trust, and we're basically the charity arm of Derby County Football Club. Um, and we're based in the East Midlands of the UK, so very central in the, um, in the country. And what we do, this is our mission statement that you can see on the screen now, but we work in the local community and we aim to provide experiences and opportunities for any participant that wants to engage with us. And we use sport and physical activity as that intervention to get people to work with us and use that as a way to help them improve their lives um, and their sort of community and their well-being. And we work in some of the most hard to reach areas. So you know, people that are in affluent areas have access to sport and physical activity. But what we pride ourselves on is going out and doing that outreach work in some of the most hard to reach areas. So where language may be a barrier or they may not have the financial um, means to enable them to take part in sport. So we take the sport to them and set up in their community and offer those activities um, for people to be involved. Uh, the second half of this slide that you can see are our corporate values. So we try and make sure that anything that we deliver meets one or many of these values. And we pride ourselves on sort of meeting them. And our, all of our staff that are involved in the charity work by those values as well. So um, you can see in there that partnerships is a big thing for us and taking pride in our work and creating those meaningful experiences. So very similar to ISCA values, I guess. You know, we, we want people to become more physically active um, and be able to take part in sport and for that to form part of their everyday lifestyle. Um, obviously, with, with everybody else in, in the world, the pandemic has hit us hard and it's made us change the way that we deliver things. But pre-pandemic, we were working with um, around 30,000 participants annually, and that equates to us delivering 200 plus weekly sessions. Um, so that's face-to-face -face sessions um, delivering sport and physical activity. Um, as an organisation, we've got around 70 members of staff, so we're quite a large charity. And we work across lots of different areas, including school sport, um, through to community engagement, mental health and disability sports. So we've got a real range of work that we offer. 
Um, and we've got um, coaching, coaching staff that deliver sort of football coaching in school time and out of school time, right through to a cancer recovery program using sort of sport as that uh, mechanism to help people who are recovering through cancer treatments. Um, one of the things that we also offer is a degree um, a program. So for people that want to continue learning, but um, learning in a more sport focused background, we offer an opportunity for those as well. Um, I could spend probably the whole presentation talking to you about the work that we do because there is so much, but uh, we do need to move on to the event. So what I would say is if you're interested in learning more about us as an organisation, um, visit our website, which is derbycountycommunitytrust.com. Um, and on there, we've got a section for every programme that we offer. And you can also download our latest annual report, which will show you a bit more about sort of case studies and our success stories. Um, as I mentioned, obviously, the pandemic meant that we had to stop a lot of that face to face delivery. But what we did do is move everything to a virtual platform. So we didn't want to stop that engagement with our participants because they are some of the most vulnerable people that we that are in our community. So we just moved everything to a digital learning platform. And, and you know, the, the numbers sort of speak for themselves, really, there that we've done over 500,000 minutes of virtual delivery. 67 different virtual lessons and we also encouraged our staff to volunteer to help in that re uh, pandemic recovery so we um, volunteered at local food banks to ensure that um, food was still being distributed to those that most need it um, and a lot of our volunteers and participants themselves got involved in that so we we did completely change the way that we worked but it meant that our participants were still getting that support that they need and sort of my role within all of this is um, in events and fundraising, and it's to generate unrestricted funds that enable us to continue these programmes or set up new programmes that we need to in the community. And the way that sort of we generate those funds are through an events and fundraising portfolio. Um, and the Derby 10K, which I'm going to talk to you about today, is our sort of largest fundraising event. Um, and I'll sort of explain a bit more about the impact that, the, um, that COVID has had on that as well. But it's our biggest fundraising event and it enables us to generate unrestricted funds that can support these programmes. Um, before I go into a bit more detail about it, I am going to show you a video. And this video is from 2019, which is the last time that we were able to host a face to face event. Um, we are hopeful we'll be able to deliver a, an event of this scale in October later this year. But for now, this video just sort of shows you our last event in 2019. So I'll just leave this to play for you. <laughs> As you can see, Pride Park is heaving this morning, but it's not match day. It's the morning of the Derby 10K, probably the biggest day of the year for the Derby County Community Trust. I've got my number. I'm running it for the first time this year. Let's go. Fabulous morning so far. It's about quarter past nine, so all the ways have gone with the Derby 10k. Everyone's looking fit and healthy, and it's all gone to plan so far. So, touch wood, we'll get the leaders coming through in about the next 15 or so minutes, and it's been a, a, a fabulous morning. Just on the fundraising side, we hopefully will pass £30,000 of money raised uh, for the 10k, which will redirect into all our programs so we can make sure that we deliver fantastic opportunities for people throughout Derbyshire. Really wanted to get involved with something local to the Derby site, so we thought Derby County Community Trust was a really important um, charity for the area, and the 3K was the perfect place to sponsor. There's a great atmosphere because everybody's running the 10K first, and then all the fun runners get involved and join the 3K, and it's just a way to get everybody involved from all ages and give the um, community a bit of support. To be uh, headline sponsor of the uh, Derby 10K. Um, we're in our third year of our partnership now with Derby County Football Club, uh, so it's absolutely brilliant to be able to extend that support now uh, to the Trust as well. 
Um, we have you know, a load of customers in uh, Derby and the surrounding areas and we believe strongly in the importance of community projects. So yeah, absolutely brilliant to be, uh, to be involved in the Derby 10K. It's the first sort of run I've ever done. Uh, I'm really pleased I did it. I'll definitely do it again. I had a really funny moment running through town when I went past Pure Gym and saw people on the treadmills, and that's usually me. I thought, this is way more fun than that. So many people, like, still finishing. Spirit, the whole place is great. Definitely want to do it again, and I'd encourage anyone to get a go as well. So as you can see, um, hopefully that demonstrated sort of the scale of our event. Um, and I'm going to come on to sort of the numbers and sort of show how we've built it to be what it is. It didn't start off at that sort of scale and those amount of numbers by any means. Um, we started off small and we have grown it, but that's sort of where we are, um, well, where we were pre-pandemic and we hope we can get to that sort of level of engagement and participation again as soon as we can this year. Um, but to, to give you an idea of sort of the impact of the event, so as I mentioned, we the main sort of driver for us is that it generates funds for us as a charity that we can invest back into the community, which you would have heard Simon talk about on the video. Um, and the event in a normal year um, generates around £120,000 um, um, contribution to Derby County Community Trust. So that's the income that we get from the event. And once we've associated all of the costs to the event, it still it leaves us with a net surplus of around £38,000 for the charity, which is fantastic. Um, and as I say, all of that money is invested back into the community programmes that we offer. Um, the way that we sort of keep the costs down, so, so what a lot of other organisations will do is uh, pay for an event management company to come in and run their event for them. But we do all of that work internally. So um, that's sort of my role is to plan and deliver the event. So we don't outsource any of the work. We keep it all internally, which in, in turn helps us with that final profit figure. Um, what our event is also quite unique in is that not only does it generate profits for us as a community trust, it generates money for other charities. Um, and what we've done there is develop a charity package where other local charities can bulk buy spaces into our event at a discounted space. And then they use those spaces as a fundraising opportunity for their own supporters. Um, so similar to the big events in the world, so London Marathon, you, you, know, you can enter as a charity runner and you have a minimum fundraising target that you need to meet. So we, are, we work with other local charities to offer a similar scheme. And in our latest event, so the 2019 event, we did some research in that those charities we partnered with, um, we generated our event, enabled them to generate another £33,000. So yeah, if you add those sort of totals up together, you can see that it, you know, the, charity, the event purely does generate money for us as a charity and other, other local charities. Um, and that 33,000 for other charities is just taken from one fundraising platform. Um, so we just did analysis through one platform and we know that there's many others out there. So it is likely to be a lot higher. Um, so the, that's sort of a bit of a financial impact of what the event is. And this one shows you how, what numbers it takes to get to those financial figures. Um, so as I mentioned previously, the event has been going for 20 years and it's grown significantly over those years. Um, in 2019, so our last event, we had over 5,000 participants and that was our largest field size to date. So you know, we, we grew the event significantly um, and 80% of those runners take part in the 10K, which you would have seen on the screen, the ones in the pink t-shirts. Um, and then another 20% take part in the fun run, which were also on the video, the uh, younger participants on the start line. So we offer the main 10K events um, and what we find is a lot of people, um, the age restriction on the 10K is 16 plus. So people will do the 10K 
they'll then come back and run the fun run with their family. So it's a really nice atmosphere in that we set the fun run after the event. So we give time to, for people to do the 10K, come back and then take part where a lot of other events, especially in our area, will set the fun run off once the 10K has cleared the start line. Um, but we, we like the fact that people can come back and do it as a whole family. So it's really nice to see that. Um, and yeah, I've tried to sort of show how we got to our number really, but the earliest figures that I could find were from 2002. Um, and as you can see on those numbers, we were well under the thousand um, mark for people entering our event, our event. So it has taken us quite a few years to achieve the over the 5,000. And it was really interesting looking back through these figures to see where we had a dip in our numbers or where we had a significant increase. Um, and I didn't, I couldn't fit them all on the screen here, but what I wanted to sort of point out is in 2012, we saw a huge increase in our numbers. And from chatting to people that were involved in the event at that time, um, we can put what was sort of con contributed to that was us having a home Olympic Games in that year. So it was the year of London 2012. The whole nation was inspired by the home games. And um, what we also introduced that year was a wheelchair friendly event. So the course was changed slightly and uh, people could take part in a wheelchair. And we were successful in getting a couple of elite wheelchair athletes to sort of come to the event. So that helped us raise the profile really. Um, where you can see the numbers dip, so 2016 and 2017, they were events that I was in position for. And what um, happened in those years is one of the years, there was another major event that was put on on the same day as us, which was uh, less than 20 miles away from us. Um, another running event. So unfortunately, we had a clash of dates there. And in 2017, um, our event fell within a school holiday period. So people had other plans. Um, and unfortunately, we, we don't have a huge amount of scope on the date of our events. We have to work with the football club to fall in line with when football matches are pe being played as well. So and because of the time of year, we normally hold the event, which is April. We have to try and avoid London Marathon because that's obviously a huge event for us um, world, world, worldwide, not just in the UK. So for 2017, unfortunately, it fell within Easter holidays, which we couldn't avoid. Um, but as you can see in 2018 and 2019, we, the numbers continued to grow. And I just wanted to give you a bit of history about this really, in that the Derby 10K was originally organized by a charity called Sporting Futures. Um, and in the autumn of 2017, we merged with Derby County Community Trust. So Sporting Futures were a lot smaller charity doing very similar work to the Community Trust. And we merged charities and organizations in uh, 2017. So the number increased in 2018 and continued into 2019, um, we think is, is definitely down to us adopting the football club brand. So it opened up our reach. Um, not only were we promoting our event to uh, our current database and the running community, we were able to start to promote our event to the football um, supporters as well. So it just sort of increased our marketing, um, marketing database and being associated with the club um, that people are very passionate about the football club in our local area. Um, so I think having an event that was held at the stadium and part of the football club really helped us increase our numbers um, and in turn increase the profits that were generated from it. Um, a bit sort of pandemic, how, how that's affected us. So 2020, we were due to hold our event in March. Um, unfortunately, as, as everybody knows, March was the month that the pandemic really took over um, and we had to postpone our event when we were two weeks away from delivering. So we'd, uh, we'd done all the hard work, the route was in place, the medals were ordered, the t-shirts were ordered and we were ready to go. But unfortunately, two weeks before the, the event day, we had to postpone. Um, we did offer a virtual event in place of the face-to-face, -face, which I think that the whole world did as well. Um, and it was really successful. And we managed to retain a lot of our runners who are then commi um, are now committed to entering in 2021. Um, we were very sort of optimistic last year in that we knew March event was canceled, but we were hoping we could maybe get something going in the autumn. Um, obviously the pandemic has uh, been going on longer than we ever anticipated so autumn didn't happen either 
and normally our event would be in the spring so 2021 we we should be holding the event now but of course we've still got restrictions in place so 2021 we've got dates um on hold in october and uh, just keeping everything crossed that we can go ahead and deliver something so we you know we we will have an, an event to the scale that you saw on the video um one day soon hopefully so that's a bit a uh, bit of history about us as a charity as an organization and a bit of history on the um, impacts that Zabi 10k has and i just wanted to take you through a bit of sort of logistics and things that i've learned along the way of planning events which will hopefully help you guys if you are looking at setting up your own european mile events or events within your organizations and industries um, and yeah, it's just a bit of a sort of learning experiences and um, top tips, I guess, that I could give you as event managers. Um, and the first one is around sort of building your team. So when I um, came into post and took over the event six years ago, I was very lucky in that there was already a really strong team um, supporting the event. And that's not just the immediate team that help organize, but the wider organizations that are needed to put events on of that scale. Um, what I've just done is continue to grow that team um, and I think that's one of the main factors that makes the event the success that it is today really and there's obviously different organizations that you'll need to involve depending on the size and scale of your event but these are some of the key people that we link with with Derby 10k um, and as you can you saw on the video it takes place in a city center a, a busy city center and we literally close the roads for um, 90 minutes on race day so to, in order to do that we have to link with our local authority um, who are derby city council um, and they grant us the road closure so we work with them really closely each year we make sure our plans are shared with them well in advance of the day um, we ensure we submit all our applications on time and we yeah we so say we literally close the roads for 90 minutes um, and that gets 5,000 runners around the course and the city is back up and running to normal capacity as soon as we're finished um, and we've just tried to really build on that relationship and prove that we can run the event successful and we can keep those road closures to a minimum um, but what we also are, are very sort of careful at doing is not only talking to them when we want the road closures we'll keep in contact with them throughout the whole year and we'll make sure that we um, show to them the impact that the event has financially and how the profits that are raised for the event are being reinvested back into the city uh, another key organization that we work with are the emergency services so depending on the scale of any events that you're organizing and whether they're having road closures you may need to involve emergency services in your planning um, and i guess they just add another layer of sort of quality assurance to your event really and a group that we have to link to and sort of present to every year is called the safety advisory group and it is what it what it is really how it how it comes across it's a group of people um, with professionals from the police service the fire service and medical partners and they become a bit of a check and challenge group really for myself so i'll present our risk assessment our plans and they'll just check that we've got all the key things covered um, and start to act as sort of mentors to to us as an organization really um, we have support for we we pay for external medical providers to come in and support the event because obviously we are quite a large scale event um, and obviously we need to look at um, emergency access to every point of the course so it's really important to build those relationships with the emergency services that are going to potentially be needed on the day should anything go wrong we also look at sort of suppliers and retailers and what we pride ourselves on is being sort of a, a, a locally organized event as I said with the profits going back into the local community and we try and keep all our suppliers as local as possible to really involve local businesses and local retailers um, and what I would say is with your suppliers get to know them as early on as you can in the planning process and understand their terms and conditions and their time scale so that there aren't any surprises that are sort of thrown in the last minute um, and with us having that local relationship, it means that they're easy, they're, they are easier to meet with when we can meet face to face um, and sort of conf uh, issues are easier to, to resolve should, should there be any if the, the sort of closer we are and the more local they are to us. 
And what we do with local retailers is we try and come up with ways that we can partner. Um, so we've got a relationship with a local running shop, for example, an uh, um, organisation that do running trainers, running clothing, and they're, they're very local to us. And they offer a discount for everybody that has a confirmation that they're entered in our event. So for us as an event organiser, it's great, great because it um, looks like the runners are getting more for their money. And for the local retailer, it means there's more people going through their door to claim their discounts, which hopefully turns into returning customers for them. So we're really trying to support local businesses at our event, as well as yeah, investing that money locally. Um, and then the last sort of company, the last uh, team members that I've got in there are our venue. Uh, so as you saw, we're based at the football club for our start and finish. And although we are the charity arm of the football club, as us as a charity aren't based at the stadium, we're, we're external to them. So we do have to build that relationship with the club as a venue. And we just make sure that we're, they're involved in the planning stages from as early as we can bring them in, really. So they know exactly what parts of the stadium we're going to use, um, what time we'll be there, what deliveries are going to be sent there. So we really build our team and make sure the venue are part of that wider team. Um, one of the main things I would say with your venue and something that we, we, you know, we again, we pride ourselves on is leaving the venue exactly as, as you found it on race morning. So we make sure every piece of litter is removed, every sign that we put up is removed. And that way they're more likely to accept you back year on year. So um, really, I guess the main thing to sort of say from this slide is to involve everybody in your planning from the very early stages. Don't just bring them in last minute. Keep them involved from the beginning. Um, and then ev everybody knows what's happening and they become your support network, really. So event management can be quite overwhelming and daunting if you're on your own. But if you build this team around you, it becomes more manageable and uh, seems more achievable. So once you've got your team that are going to help with the logistics side of it, what we then do is start to look at how we can add value. So how can we add value that's going to increase the overall profit at the end of the day? And one of the ways that we do this is via sponsorship. Um, so as, uh, as the Derby 10K grew in numbers, um, it also grew in profile and we started to become appealing to other organisations within the local community. So organisations wanted to um, start to be involved in our events and were reaching out to us to see if they could be a part of it. Um, and they wanted their brand, their brand associated with us. So we started to, to develop sponsorship packages. Um, and the way we did this is we started to look at how we could section off parts of the event. So how many potential sponsors could we get involved rather than us just having one headline sponsor? And currently um, we have a headline sponsor for the event. We have a separate sponsor for our fun run, a separate sponsor for a business team challenge, which I'll explain a bit more about later on, and a sponsor for our hydration stations, so our water stations around the route. Um, but we're continually looking to attract new sponsors and looking at other sort of sections that we could attach a sponsor to. So some areas that we're looking at developing are a volunteer sponsor, um, a signage sponsor and potentially a different sponsor for every kilometre across the, the race. Um, and all of those that I've spoke about that I've said we've got current sponsors for are all financial sponsors. So these are people that um, commit um, uh, money to us each year in return for a, a, an investment package. Um, we do have other sponsors attached to the event and that's more of an in-kind sponsorship. So they're not physically giving us cash, but they're providing a service for us and they're, they're not charging us for that service. And again, this obviously adds to the overall profit as well. Um, and I wanted to sort of give you an example of this. And I've mentioned the venue in our in the last slide. And they're a, a prime example of in-kind support. So they don't charge us for using the stadium. Um, and we do take over on the day. So say we use the, the whole of the car park, which you would have seen on the video. They open up the facilities inside the stadium and we use some of the hospitality rooms. 
So that's all provided in kind. Um, and if we were to put a value on that, it would probably add another £10,000 of expenditure to the event. So I just wanted to give you that example to say that yeah, in kind sponsorship is just as important as financial sponsorship. At, at the end of the day, it's all helping you increase that sort of profit of your events. Um, we also, you would have seen the finish line on our events, the scaffolding with the branding on. We're very lucky that all of that is provided in kind as well through a volunteer who's associated with the organisation. So, you know, we, we are very lucky and we value those relationships as much as we do a financial sponsor. And what I would say is sponsors can be attached to a, an event of any scale, whether you've got a hundred runners or a thousand runners, you could still attract sponsors to it. And it's just about adjusting sort of the values that you ask from that sponsor and looking at what you give in return. So, you know, don't think that sponsors are only interested in large scale events. They're definitely not. It can be, you know, really sort of drilled down and um, tailored to suit your size events. But one thing I would say with sponsors and when you're looking at who who to invite or who to partner with is to try and get a sponsoring organisation whose values and missions um, align with yours. And that way I think the relationship is um, mutually beneficial. So it's really hard to work with an organisation who have completely different aims and goals as you. So really try and look at sponsors where your mission and your organisation values align. And I think the relationship will just develop and be better from those. And to give you an example of this, we, we've currently signed a headline sponsor who has signed up for three years now. So a three year commitment, which is great. And they're a sports clothing brand. Um, so our sort of, you know, the, the, our audience is very appealing to them. So it's, it, you know, it will help both. And they, they've actually going to help us develop our event t-shirts in return. So it, it does work if you can get that organisation that aligns with you. Both organisations will really benefit from it rather than it just be a transactional relationship. Um, another critical fun function of the event, which I wanted to sort of touch on, are our volunteers. Um, and I think the statement on the screen just sort of really, really does justice what our volunteers do. They're one of the most important factors of our event, and we couldn't do what we do without them. Um, and it may be you know, an event of our scale. I know when I first started to take it on, it was quite overwhelming to try and decide how many volunteers we needed and where we needed to put them. So I just wanted to share a, a method that we've um, taken on with the event to sort of help manage our volunteers, really, because they are as important as paid members of, um, of the event team. So what we do is split our event into zones. Um, and some of the zones, for example, we have a start and finish zone, zone one, which is the first section of the event, right through to zone six. So we section off the 10 kilometre course into zones. Um, and within those zones, we allocate a zone leader who I guess is like your head volunteer. And then we decide how many volunteers are needed in each of those zones, depending on how many road closures they are, um, how many, how far that zone covers really. And we find that just a bit of a more manageable way to recruit and um, to make sure the volunteers get a really good experience. And that zone leader within each of those zones will act as sort of the supervisor, as I say, and they're the main person that's in direct communication with myself on race day. Um, and to give you an idea of how many sort of people we need to recruit and um, look after on the day, to make the events completely safe and secure, and um, we need around 150 volunteers. And that's across 10 different zones. So by assigning those zone leaders, it just means that key messages are only distributed to 10 people rather than we try and pass that message on to 150. And it just makes the communications more manageable. And I just wanted to share with you sort of where we get those volunteers from. So we know that you know, volunteers are really valuable, but they can be hard to come across. And especially in the sort of quantities that we need for the Derby 10K. So what we've done is linked with a number of local organisations, and I guess it's an extension of that building your team um, in that we, you know, we link with organisations who we know can provide us multiple volunteers and volunteers that have got the skills and experience that we need as well. 
So we, we link with all of our local running clubs. Um, so a lot of the running clubs will actually enter the event, but they have their own really strong volunteer network within their club as well. So if they aren't running, they more often than not would like to be at the event to support people from their club and don't mind being there in a volunteer capacity. And um, it means they get front, front row seats for the event. So, you know, they're really there as a supporter, but they're also giving you some support as well. So we always link with our local running clubs. Um, and over the past few years, we've developed really good relationships with educational establishments. So um, a local college who offer a sports um, course and a public service course. And we, we're an organisation that can offer really good work experience opportunities for students enrolled on those courses. Um, and to give you an idea, at 2019 events, um, 70% of our volunteers were made up from students from one course which was great. And yeah, we will work with the tutors to make sure that the experience the volunteer is going to get is going to benefit them on their studies. Um, and it, again, it's a mutual relationship and it works both ways. We're getting people that are really enthusiastic about the event and want to learn. And we've done similar with a university as well. So our local university uh, offers a sport management degree and as part of their second year of studies, they have to do an event management module. So we've really teamed up and on that event management module. Um, and I go in and deliver lectures to them for six weeks leading up to the event. And part of that is then they get given a section of the Derby 10K to plan and deliver. So they're learning academically, but they're also getting the hands on experience to, um, to sort of develop their qualifications even further. So it works really well for us and we tend to get returning volunteers. So once we get them at one event, they hopefully get a good enough experience that they want to come back for a following year. So you know, we, we try and really retain our volunteers as we would paid members of staff and we try and treat them as a paid member of staff. So we make sure that they get uh, briefings in advance. They get issued with a job description so they know exactly what's going to be expected from them. And they're given the opportunity to input to the debrief as well and really provide their feedback and, and what their experience as the, of the event was. So I think, uh, yeah, volunteers are a huge part for us. Um, and we, we definitely couldn't put the event on without the network that we have. Uh, I wanted to just sort of share with you about the different price points that we offer. So as our event has scaled, has scaled up, we've offered more sort of unique price opportunities, I guess, and ways to enter the event. And again, there have just been additions that we've added on as the, as the, as the years have gone on um, and a way for us to market to a new audience and try and get new audiences in. And all of these can be applied to sort of any event, again, of any scale. It doesn't have to just be the mass participation. Um, and I was thinking, so with events that you're organising, could you add a VIP package maybe? Um, and that's where runners pay slightly more money, but they receive a slightly different service. So do they get their own sort of dedicated meeting point where refreshments could be offered before and after the event, um, you know, a really unique opportunity for them. And we offer this as part of our business team challenge, um, which I spoke about earlier on with the sponsor opportunities. So our business team challenge um, is how it sounds. We market it to our corporate industry and all of the people that enter this, op uh, this option, they pay five pounds more per person on their entry fee, but that enables them to have access to a hospitality suite within the football stadium. Um, they get pre and post race refreshments. They have access to their own toilets rather than having to queue up for the portaloos outside, which seems to be the most popular thing as to why people enter. Um, and if it's a bad day weather wise, they're inside and they're not outside in the rain uh, pre and post race. But it's a way for us to sort of bring in a new audience in that corporate audience and people can enter that as as a team, as I said, um, and it's a minimum of four people and a maximum of 10 people in a team and their fastest four runners times count towards a team, uh, a team score. So back in the hospitality suite afterwards, we uh, announce our team winners and with the um, corporates 
in, in and around our local community. There's quite a bit of local competition. Every business wants to be the best. Um, so it, it generates quite a nice buzz. And what we do in that room as well is really try to demonstrate what we do as a wider charity. So it's an opportunity for us to uh, demonstrate our charity work rather than them just come up and doing a running event and going home. It's a good networking room for us. Um, we also offer discount to um, community groups, so local sort of grassroots football teams or sports clubs um, or even larger families that want to enter. So if there's um, a, a large group, we tend to do a discount and that could either be a 10% discount on your booking or pay for three people and receive the fourth person free of charge. So we really try and work with the community groups that approach us and come up with an offer that's best for, for them as a community group, but also financially stable for us as an organization. And that community group aspect has really grown over the years. Um, and the largest team that we have is around 80 under 12 year olds that enter from um, a large football team in the in the community and they all run in their football kit which is great to see on on event day so it's a really good community feel in that fun run at the end of the day um, and schools is another um an area that we're trying to really develop so the fun run is perfect opportunity to get schools involved um, but with our event being at the weekend so we normally hold the event on a sunday what we're what we're finding is teachers aren't um as willing to promote the opportunity and bring classes out because it is a weekend. So there's an opportunity, I think, still to develop the schools area in that maybe we can put on a schools fun run on the Friday and then the main event on a Sunday. And that's something that we will look to develop and to continue to grow our events um, in the future, really. It's a, a good opportunity for us to sort of add, add another aspect to the event and appeal to more audiences. Um, of course, with all of these, what I would say is if you're looking at introducing um, different price points, you need an entry system that will support it and, and enable you to do it. So you know, we're very lucky in that we've got an IT team who build our entry system for us and we can offer all these different opportunities. But obviously, if you're a smaller event and you're just starting out, it may be that you're on paper entry forms, which would probably become too difficult to offer all of these. And I, I, you know, I've said it at the beginning, but I would say again, remember that this event has been going for 20 years and it's taken us a long while to get to here. So if it is your first um, event, don't worry about overcomplicating it really. We've only developed these because our systems have enabled us to be able to do it. Um, and thinking about the price points really and that entry system process, I thought I'd just sort of, um, come to the end and finish on these really and one thing that I think is really important again whichever event and um, whatever scale of event you're doing is just thinking about the customer journey so I've so, spoke a lot about the project planning I guess and how you project plan your events I think once you've got all those little sections in place take a step back and think about it from the runner's perspective um, so think about what the participant does and what their journey is and how can you provide that wraparound support to make that as easy as possible. Um, and going right back to sort of how people hear about your event. So what's your marketing and communications strategy? And where are you going to market your events? Um, one of the things we found really useful um, a few years ago was going out to other events that are similar to your to your event and marketing to them because they're, they're the type of people that are going to enter. Um, and we used to go to a lot of running events in and around the local community and hand leaflets out on the finish line for our event because people, if they've had a good event, they're motivated, they want to know what the next one is. And that was really useful for us. What I would say is check with the host, the organiser of that event, that they're OK with you doing that. Um, and the majority of them will be. And we had a really good uptake from entries um, when we monitor our um, hits on our website and number of entries that come in. We'd always find that if we went to an event on a Sunday morning and handed out leaflets, Sunday afternoon we'd see an influx in people entering. So just start to think about where your audience might be and how you can communicate to them. Um, social media has just developed massively recently and there's some really, you know, really good ways that you can really tailor your marketing through Facebook and pay in to boost your post to reach your audience. So I would 
you know, and you don't have to spend a huge marketing and communications budget on doing the few sponsored Facebook posts. So it's really a good way to promote your events. Um, and then think about your entry system. As I mentioned before, once the people have heard about your event, where do they go to enter? And just try and make that system as easy as possible and um, only sort of gather the information that you really need for your runner. And just to speed that process up, so people don't, you know, we all buy things online, I guess, and register for to things. You, you don't want to be spending a huge amount of time filling in online information. So just really think about what information you need and just make sure that that's the only information that you collect for GDPR purposes as well and data protection. Um, so once your runner is entered, there's going to be a bit of downtime then. And what I would say is that's the time when you move on to all those logistics planning that we spoke about. So that's where you can focus on your volunteer recruitment, making sure you've got the right authority to close roads or host events. And as you get closer to event day, start to think about the pre-race information and how you communicate that to your runners. Um, and what I would say in here is uh, we've learned as years go on and our pre-race information becomes a longer document every year that we put an event on because we know the type of questions that are going to be asked. So I wouldn't worry about th this document being too long. I think people would rather have too much information than not enough. So start to really include the sort of time scale of the day. Um, what time do people need to arrive? What's the start time of your event? How far in advance would you advise them to come? Um, what facilities and amenities are going to be there on the day? Can people get, say, tea or coffee? And are there changing rooms? Is there somewhere for people to leave their bags? Are there going to be prizes and medals? Um, we found that every, everybody loves a medal. So we, we make sure that everybody receives a finishers t-shirt and a medal. And we make sure that that's made clear in the, in the pre-race the pre -race information as well as the entry information. Um, and thinking about sort of a big thing that we've had to think about here is um, car parking. So with the amount of people that we've got traveling to the city, um, the stadium car park is normally one of the biggest car parks that we've got in the city, but we take it over on race day. So we make sure the runners know where else they can park and where they can leave their cars and that that's going to be secure. So we, we do pay to bring in security to monitor those car parks that we're promoting as events, uh, event spaces. But we also have to think about where we place those car parks because of the road closures that we put in place. So to give you an idea, our um, course record holder for the Derby 10K um, finished the event in 28 minutes. Um, and that was about four years ago. So our first runner was coming over the finish line as we were still setting off our last wave of runners from the start line. So we have to really plan our car parks carefully that those faster runners can get to their cars and they're not stuck in road closures and they can vacate straight away. So a bit of a logistical light nightmare really, but it's worth spending the time to get that right, to keep every runner happy so that they're not sat in their cars for 90 minutes. Um, and that sort of comes on to that leaving the event really. Think about what that, what that plan is and can your runners vacate um, quickly and as soon as they, they finish the event. Um, Think about how you're going to publish your results and make sure that your entrants know when the results are to be expected. Um, so there's nothing worse than as an event manager, you're trying to tidy down the event and make sure all your post-race reports are done and your email just keeps pinging asking when the results are going to be published. So if you make that clear in your pre-race information, it will hopefully stop all of those questions coming in post-race. Um, and to give you an idea of what we do, so we publish um, provisional results, we, we try and get them done within three hours of the last runner come in over the finish line. And we, we do our event by a chip timing system. So every runner runs with an electronic chip. So it's easy to automatically generate those results for us. And they go on our website as provisional. Um, and people are given seven days to query any results. Um, and at which point we close the provisional period and we issue final results one week after the event. And we just make sure the runners know that that's the process so that they know that they've got that window to query anything in their systems. And we, we do get queries that sometimes the timing chip fails to work, but we also record the finish line. So if that is the case, we can still see the runner come in and know roughly what time they did. Um, 
and evaluate the event, I guess, is a key thing for us. And it, it's something that I think we do need to get better at with the Derby 10K. Um, we're, we're definitely not a perfect event and there's lots of areas we can develop. And one of which is the evaluation, uh, because you do get so wrapped up in closing everything down, packing away, um, celebrating the success, doing the uh, uh, results queries that the evaluation seems to sort of seems to get lost sometimes but we try and make sure that we hold um, debriefs with all of our volunteers all of our staff that work on the event and we always communicate to our and to our lead runners to check how the experience was for them for any large groups that we've got entering and um, so we want to make sure that the event experience is just as good for an individual as it is for a large group um, but I think it is something we could definitely do better in areas that we could improve on and finally, um, I just wanted to sort of say, once the event is over, you've cleared up, you're back, you've slept, because uh, I'm sure if anybody is in an event management role, the few weeks leading up to it, you do get little sleep. But <laughs> when you've finally caught up on it all and you feel recovered, think about sharing the success and really shouting about the impact that your event has had. And that's not only the financial impact, but the social impact. So can you collect um, good news stories from people? And if you put what we do on social media, we, we put a shout out asking, have you got a story to share? Do you want to tell us about why you're running the Derby 10K? And then we follow up with them afterwards and really sort of do a, a really good case study on them to promote the event. And they start to become your marketing material for when you open your event for the following year. Um, and people will be will want to share their story because they're proud of what they're doing. And that could be that they're running for a particular charity. Um, it's their first ever 10K that they've done or they're running in memory of someone. And they're all really nice stories that help keep the momentum going of your event at the end um, and keep that sort of noise going until you're ready to start promoting the following year's events. Uh, we, as I said in the beginning, we try and link with the local authority and really start to show the social, social and economic return that our event has on the city. So the numbers that we bring to the events, plus their spectators, you're probably looking at closer to sort of eight to 10,000 people that are involved in it. And that's people that are in the city, they're spending in local shops, local restaurants, so it really is sort of a social return for the events as well, rather than just a financial impact for us. And we try to prove that and show that, you know, the event is good for the city. Um, although we shut the roads and some motorists may be upset, the long term effects are, are really positive for the city. Um, and as I sort of said, in normal years, what we what we try to do. So once we've incorporated the period for results to be queried, our event normally takes place at the end of March. That would probably take us to mid-April. We then start to really plan out, make sure our marketing campaign covers post-events as well. So think about what are we going to release post-events? Um, are we going to release photos of the events, um, publish the results, do a case study on our success stories? And then we start to generate the build-up for the following year. So we normally... Um, promote our event in the June for the following year. The event takes place in March. June time, we release an open entries for the event and we start to generate the noise again. So we just really try and keep it go in a year long cycle, I guess. As soon as the event is finished, we do this share the success and we move on to the following year. Um, so yeah, it keep, keeps us busy. And to say we're a charity of around 70 members of staff um, but I'm the only event manager in that. So it's, you know, it's keep, keeps us all busy and we, we've got a fantastic team and they all chip in on the day, but the planning side just come to me. And I think that's, you know, it's really important that that's how we've tried to, we can keep our costs down because we keep it in house rather than outsource all of that organizing. Um, I think that is everything really. So it's a really quick whistle stop tour of the Derby 10K and Derby County Community Trust. And I think what I would say is if I could give you sort of three, three tips, um, three things to, or a few things to take away from the event, it's around building that team and building those partner organisations that can really help you deliver the event um, and look at ways that you can keep costs down with those in-kind donations um, or ways to add additional value to it through sponsorship. Um, and then I think finally, just you know, 
don't don't get too overwhelmed by it. The, as I keep saying, the Derby 10K, it's been going for 20 years. It's taken us time to get to the scale that we're at. But everything that I've shared with you today can be scaled down to deliver an event to less than 1,000 people. The principles of it are, are exactly the same and it is manageable and it's, you know, it's doable. And the sense of achievement that you get post events is worth all the hard work. It's, uh, it really is one of our favourite weekends in the sort of in the calendar for us as an organisation because it brings a wider team together. It really does bring everybody together. Um, so it's worth putting the time and effort in to, to get to the end and um, target and to get that sort of buzz from it all.